So let's get started with our session, uh, serverless machine learning. So my name is Luis. I am a Microsoft MVP from Mexico in AI and developer technologies. Although I am currently living in Czech Republic because I am pursuing my PhD at Tomas Vata University in Slin. Um, well, yeah, I also do research and uh, work about uh, artificial intelligence, face recognition, and emotion detect detection. That's my uh, thesis topic. I also work as a lecturer here at the university in Slin and also in Mexico. Uh, well, I got some permission from them, but still I am, let's say, close to, to the university. Uh, greetings if anyone is joining from, from Mexico. <clears throat> and also something that I uh, like is that I have some friends uh, who share this passion about uh, technology, about uh, gathering together to, to, to discuss some interesting topics. Uh, mobile application development with summary in cloud computing with Azure and also artificial intelligence. So yeah, here you have my contact details in case that you would like to further discuss any of these uh, topics. Feel free to, to reach out. All right, so these are the uh, topics that we are going to discuss during our uh, session. Uh, we will start with brief introduction about uh, .NET development. Then we will talk about ML.NET, which is a framework to do machine learning, uh, especially aimed for .NET developers. Then we will talk about uh, serverless and Azure functions, how we can have our code running in the cloud and executed or triggered by some events. Then we will see how we can combine these two technologies in order to provide solution for other type of applications that would like to consume our machine learning models. Let's uh, move forward to our introduction. Well, uh, lately <coughs> we, have, uh, find, we have found out that .NET is a platform that cover many, many things that cover many technologies. You can use .NET to create desktop applications uh, with uh, Windows Forms, which has been uh, in the field for more than 15 years. Also, there is WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, Universal Windows Platform, or, or Windows 10. You can also create web applications, both backend and frontend, by using C Sharp language, for example, developing ASP.NET Core projects. Then you can also publish them into Azure or another cloud providers, especially the .NET Core projects, which are cross-platform. Uh, you can develop mobile applications cross-platform that, that run on Android, iOS, Windows 10 devices by using Xamarin. There is Unity for uh, video game uh, development, IoT, and also artificial intelligence or machine learning projects by using uh, some frameworks such as ML.NET, which we are going to, to discuss. So basically, you can use this platform, ML.NET, to create, to target different type of applications. And .NET is not only about the language, not, so, not only about C Sharp, F Sharp, or Visual Basic .NET. It also covers a set of tools, such as Visual Studio for Windows or uh, for Mac. Currently, there is version 2019, but next month, uh, version 2022 is released uh, around the time that .NET 6, which is the next version of .NET, is uh, released for general availability. There, is, there are also tools for command line interface, CLI tools, and Visual Studio Code for cross-platform development, which means that <clears throat> if you are using Linux, you can also 
create applications using Visual Studio Code, which is more than an editor. Okay, it, it, uh, it's a set of tools. You can add extensions to increase functionality. .NET also covers a set of libraries. Uh, there are different components that you can use in your applications. Uh, there is .NET standard, .NET core, .NET framework, right? Depending on the type of application that you are developing. There is a set of compilers, runtime components that you can interact with. So uh, as some, you can use different, let's say, frameworks, different libraries to cover any of these type of projects. One of these tools is ML.NET. But what is machine learning? Well, basically, basically, sorry, <clears throat> it's part of artificial intelligence. It's a field that focuses on creating applications that are trained from data. They learn, they identify patterns. Usually, this data is uh, something that we gather in the past. Companies have a lot of historic data that they, they can use to predict the future. But how this, uh, how this is created? Well, basically, we have a set of algorithms that, through iterations or through epochs, analyze the data that we have. Oh, yeah, I, I'm forgetting about something really important. Our data, let's say, is, is, is raw. It's in data sets, in data, databases. Maybe we have some files, CSV files, text files. And we need to uh, clean it a bit. Maybe we, we, we apply some transformations in order to normalize the data to categorize it, maybe to, to remove missing values or replace these zeros or null values with uh, mean, average, or, or some other uh, data, right? In order to avoid, as I said, this uh, missing information. Well, after we prepare, after we clean, our data, then we can apply some machine learning algorithm, maybe a neural network, right? Maybe a regression algorithm, something. And this one, through iterations, will understand the data, will learn from it, will identify, as I said, patterns, right? And the output will be a machine learning model. This one, uses the training data to, to know what to predict later. When we provide new data based on the knowledge that it acquired, it will create some results. For example, if in our historic data we had pictures of dogs and cats, the model, the neural network, will identify or distinguish between these two classes. Later, when we provide a new picture on trained data of some dog that we take, like maybe a real-time picture, it will be able to, with some confidence level, with some probability or accuracy, it will know or it will learn, okay, yeah, this is a dog. Or it will tell us this is a dog. If it tells us it is a cat, but the picture was actually a dog, well, it means that our model needs to be improved. Maybe we need to provide more data. Maybe we need to adjust, tune some parameters. We need to do something to improve the accuracy. Yeah, machine learning models are dynamic. Actually, they are not static. Uh, so we can provide new examples to make our models better. 
We can also, before pushing these machine learning models into production, we can validate them. We can evaluate them, right? Usually, we do this by splitting our historic data in two groups, training data and validation data, right? So after we train, after we create a model, then we provide this validation data. We already know the, the, the result. We, we know, OK, in this picture, there is a cat. In second picture, there is a dog. So we will compare this with what the model says. And that's how we can measure the metrics, the accuracy of the model. And we are able to see, OK, yeah, the model is performing well, but it, it needs improvement. In order to predict the future or new data, that, that's the objective behind machine learning. And depending on what it is predicting, we can talk about learning tasks. For example, right? if we know the name of the classes like dog, cat, or maybe simply uh, there is dog or there is not dog, right? or, or something even easier we, with something that we use every day. We have email. right? We receive email in our inbox, in our account. So usually, this uh, uh, engine, maybe uh, Gmail or Outlook, they, they have some machine learning model that evaluates whatever is coming to our inbox. And depending on the features, on the characteristics of this email, such as who is sending the information, what is the content, uh, wh what e IP address uh, was this email sent from, Maybe if there is some attachment, it can also do or perform quick scan. And it will determine whether it's uh, a spam email or not, right? And based on this classification, it will go to the right uh, inbox or folder, right? These models are not perfect at all. Sometimes we might find some false positives, like, right? like some mm, correct email was sent to the spam. Uh, but why was it? Maybe because the domain was uh, really new. So, so the rule was really strict, right? But we can always uh, improve it. We, we can always say, OK, yeah, for the next time, exclude this from spam, so which means, OK, yeah, this email address, it's, it's, it's OK for me. OK. So, so, so yeah, we can have classification or different classes. If we don't know the name of the classes, but we would like to gather or group data according to how close they are, how similar they are, then we talk about clustering. We can see this example, for example, for, for instance, in recommendation uh, websites or in online store. You, you know, th these products that appear to us, they are not random. Like, OK, maybe you are interested in this product, or maybe the market, uh, target marketing. Based on our historic uh, purchases, or maybe if the model classify us with other similar users with similar behavior, right? For example, maybe uh, I have searched in, in this online store for some products. I like sports, I like video games, right? So, if the company is running a campaign which uh, includes some discount on video games or on sports, I will be a good candidate for uh, to, 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 to send this uh, email or, or this message. But other people 
might not be the right choice because they like to buy other things, maybe clothes, right? Not nothing related with with me. We don't like spam. We don't want uh, companies to send us a lot of email. But if this email is uh, optimis, optimized, like target, only the the right email is sent to us, then yeah, they will get better outputs, right? Because also there are some cost associated when they send email yeah so 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 that's the idea we we can i can be part of one cluster with similar behavior that that that, that meant that mean. and finally when we want to predict some value some number such as uh, the price of some trip or uh, what grade a student is going to, to to get in this course based on who is teaching the the, the 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 subject what is the previous history of this student and maybe some other conditions we, we can predict what will be the outcome of this student right the the, the value yeah so th this is the task of regression and and in today's example we are going to 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 perform regression in machine learning. Usually, when we go to uh, some course or when we want to learn about machine learning, R or Python are the languages um, that that you can use and, and that you can learn to perform these these tasks. They are stable. There is a huge community behind. There are a lot of libraries, right? But what is uh, for .NET developers? Well, ML.NET is one option for, for them. ML.NET is an open source cross-platform framework for machine learning. We can control the life cycle of machine learning of what we just discussed. Uh, by creating, developing a uh, software uh, or a program that uses this set of libraries. We can obtain data from databases, data sets, we can read files and integrate them into our machine learning life cycle. We can perform some operations such as the transformations. We can uh, create pipeline to go through our data and then train it. And we will produce a model. This model comes in from form of a zip file, right? So this, this zip file, compress file, is actually a serialization of the algorithm that we use, the data schema, and other interesting uh, findings for, for this model. We can take this model and integrate it into other types of applications, such as web application, console application, and not yet, but soon, mobile application. So our model can be consumed, can be used to predict uh, some outcomes. And, and yeah, be, be, be part of, of some, uh, a scenario. Basically, you can solve different machine learning uh, problems. For example, you can perform sentiment analysis. You, you can analyze some text and then find if uh, it is positive or negative or neutral. We can also perform anomaly detection. For example, uh, fraud detection. Maybe we have uh, um, a bunch of uh, data like uh, financial operations, we know that some of them are normal or valid transactions, but there are a few which are uh, fraudulent activities, uh, fake bank accounts or something, right? And for banks, it is really important to identify this because 
they include money and banks don't want to lose money. Anyone wants to look, lose money, correct? So it is highly important to identify this in order to prevent them to go further. So yeah, we can perform this. We can also uh, use uh, TensorFlow or perform image classification and object detection to create deep neural networks with ML.NET and other scenarios that, that we can solve, right? So it is not a limit framework. Actually, it is quite powerful. Uh, this is some code I, I will show you uh, later, of course, when, when we go to, to our demo. But, but yeah, you, you can use C Sharp or F Sharp, by the way, to develop an ML.NET uh, program. First of all, we use the um, so, some, we, we have some data, okay? Maybe we have CSV file, which includes the, actually, I, I can show you here, which includes taxi trip information. We know, okay, there was some vendor. There is some uh, rate, right? One, two, three, some tariff. We also know how many people uh, were part of some trip, right? Also, we, we have how much time the, the trip took, how much uh, distance was uh, part, and also if the user paid uh, by credit or cash. These are some factors that impact the amount that we have to pay for this trip. So, so yeah, we, we have thousands maybe of, of, of data that we would like to analyze, we would like to predict based on new conditions, what is the fair amount for, for a new trip? And we know that five people will be traveling the trip will take around uh, 20 minutes. The distance is uh, approximately four kilometers, right? And yeah, and some, some other stuff. So, so we would like to know beforehand in advance how much we are going to pay. So we can create a machine learning model for that, right? And well, for, for, for that, Usually, we, we start by setting an ML context uh, object. OK, let me do this a bit larger. Yes, ML context. Oh, and by the way, yeah. We, we also have to add a NuGet package, which is Microsoft ML. This is the starting point of everything. Uh, ML.NET is available as a NuGet package that you can easily integrate in our solutions. Then, when we add this Microsoft ML, we are able to create ML context for all the operations, for all the transformations, the training process and prediction, we need a context, okay? Uh, yeah, after that, we can read our data, the, the file that you saw, load it in memory, but actually, this uh, loading process is uh, on demand. Actually, it's sorry, it's it, it uses lazy loading, which means that not all the data is in the memory. Only when we need it, let's say by, by groups, for example. Uh, so yeah, we, we and we load it into an object known as data view. This data view, it's like a virtual table which has an schema or columns. These columns represent our data. And, and you saw we, we were talking about some features, right? The uh, number of people who is traveling, who are traveling, sorry, the uh, fair amount, which is the data that we want to predict, the uh, and so on, right? 
And well, we use some concept which comes from uh, object-oriented programming, which is a class, right? Taxi trip class, and then we have vendor ID, passenger count, trip distance, and other properties, right? So these are used when we load the information uh, in, in memory, okay? Just give me a second, yes, we are here. After that, we perform some cleaning process or we copy some columns, we apply one hot encoding in order to get the categories that are included in our data. Right. So, so we build a pipeline, which is a set of activities that our model needs, sorry, our context needs to perform before the training process actually start. With this simple line, fit, with the fit, we start the training process. And as you can see, part of the pipeline was to decide what classific, sorry, what machine learning task we need to perform. In this case, it's regression because as I explained a, a bit earlier, we are predicting some value, numeric value. This is regression. Then we select some algorithm, fast three, for example, but there are others. And select uh, fast forest, fast three. There is a Poisson regression, uh, SDCA, online gradient descent, and other options. For this example, I selected fast three. Usually, for algorithms, you also need to add a NuGet package, as you can see here, Microsoft ML fast three. So this process takes some time, depending on. Uh, computational resources that we have, also on how much data we are evaluating. And after we finish, we, we get a model. Then, as you can see in, in my process, I can validate this data. Maybe you saw that I have two files, train and test. Test has exactly the same structure, but new data. Right. This is the, the process that I told you at the beginning. We have historic data. We split in two groups. We can perform this, uh, let's say, uh, manually. Maybe I have these two files, or I can, I, I just have one file, so I can apply some transformation in order to, okay, split this data in two groups. Um, usually, uh, but uh, well, this depends on on our experience. So sometimes we. Uh, select 80% of historic data, go for training, and 20% to evaluation. But it can be 75, 20, 25%, or, or something different. Okay. Well, with the validate data, uh, I know I, I know that for every every row, every data row, right? My objective, my goal is to compare what the model says and compare it with, with this value. For example, I know that the price for this trip was uh, 15.5, uh, sorry, 15 dollars and 50 cents. I know that for this second trip with these uh, characteristics, the price was $10 and, and so on. So what my model says, maybe the model for this first one says, okay, you have to pay uh, $14. So it means there is difference of uh, one dollar and a half. Maybe for second trip, the model says you have to pay nine dollars seventy-five cents. Okay, so it's a bit closer, right? So we can find or measure the the, the difference, right? And uh, of course, our objective is that the model is close to to what happens in in real life, right? So we would like to reduce these errors. And we can find this maybe by using another, sorry, we can improve this by using another trainer, by increasing the amount of data that I have in order to discover, for example, what is part of the knowledge? What is part of the learning process? To find out, for example, the influence of every column. Because as you saw, we have number of passengers, we have trip distance, trip time. Uh, each of these ha uh, have a different impact on the price 
and, and we can find out uh, a bit later, right? So, so yeah, maybe we can even discard some of them if we consider, okay, these columns, these attributes are not relevant for what you, for what you are predicting. So, uh, and you know, well, everything com uh, consumes uh, resources. So if we know that some attribute, some column uh, doesn't really correlate with the outcome, just discard it and focus on the other ones, right? Well, so yeah, we, we find this in, in the validation. So uh, as you can see, we apply regression and then we, we, we can get some metrics. For example, the R square, we need to reduce this and also the error, correct? Well, and after that, we, we will find, okay, your model has this accuracy or this error level. We can apply it for prediction. As you can see, we have sample trip. We have some, some data and well, this is not relevant, but I know that and the observed value for this was 15.5. So let's see what the model says, right? At the beginning, we say fair amount is zero because we want to know what is the prediction, correct? We create something called prediction engine, right? In this case, we load the model. Ah, yeah, I forgot to say that there is an important thing, which is save. Let me tell you, send you back here. Yeah, which is the... Uh, oh, sorry, I think I should have it. Yeah, save, save model. I mentioned you that there is a zip file. So this uh, file, I can later load it for the prediction task. Okay, good. So, so yeah, we, 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 we load it with, with this ML model and we predict it. So let's run it. So maybe let's select this trainer. Let's... So uh, run the application. It will take some time, but uh, maybe a few seconds to analyze these uh, thousands of data and get some model, okay? Let me turn on this here, okay, good. So yeah, you, you can see, for example, that there is a 3.3 uh, error, margin of error, and the prediction for this sample trip is about $14.63, but the actual fare was 15. Okay, so maybe we are a bit close, right? We, we can improve this, as I said. Okay, so, so yeah, we can use this console application to improve it, to try other trainer, yeah. But maybe we are satisfied with this uh, model. Well, as you can see, this ML model was just created right now here in Czech Republic. It's uh, 5, uh, 35 p.m., right? So yeah, maybe we are happy with, with this. Uh, and we will use this later in some application. So yeah, we are maybe already done with the first part. So yeah, we can, uh, I more or less explain this. There are different packages. There are different libraries that you can use to cover different scenarios. Uh, just to mention one, for example, if we are we want to create image classification or object prediction, we need to add some packages such as Microsoft ML Vision, Image Analytics, and TensorFlow, Redis, and yeah, there are other uh, models that we can use. I already told you about the ML context, which is always present. There is data schema that where we load our, our data, we have some classes. Yeah, I already mentioned this. And you have, we apply some transformation. We have some algorithms, linear uh, uh, vector machines, super vector machines, k-means for clustering tasks, right? And at the end, we get this uh, model as an output to integrate it later in our application. So we already explored the demo. Uh, by the way, I I will share the I have a link uh, for you later. So th this is already on GitHub. So I will share the link uh, a bit later. So this is the first part of, of this talk, machine learning. We have the model. Now, what do we do with the model? How we can integrate it in other applications? Uh, so so this one can consume it, right? Well, one way is to create an API, maybe app service, uh, and then load it, right, to, 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 to predict, to generate no, uh, knowledge or output based on 
the, the, the information that we are sending to this API. One possibility is to have it on serverless uh, implementation. But what is serverless? OK. Serverless is part of evolution of application platforms. Before the cloud, uh, we live in on-premises world. What is on-premises? Basically, that companies have to buy uh, some server, which is not cheap. Then developers or IT um, department need to focus on, OK, what operating system should I install? How to improve security, not only on digital or software, but also on physical uh, location, right? Where should my uh, hardware or server should be? Who is going to get access to it? As I said, both on site or maybe in remote connection. Uh, and many other uh, issues or problems that we should worry about. Then, thanks to the cloud, we can save some cost. We can leverage some of these issues to a cloud provider. Then we have infrastructure as a service. Basically, instead of buying some physical server, you rent a virtual one. But still, you need to worry about the operating system that you are going to install there, security patches, updates, and the software that you need to install there to, to provide some services. But you don't worry about the physical location. You don't buy physical hardware. Right? There are other offerings, such as Platform as a Service, PaaS, where you reduce your responsibilities Right now, Microsoft, let's say, or some other cloud provider, uh, uh, ha have these uh, this other responsibilities. For example, they already have the virtual uh, operating system installed. They install also the the security patches, updates, right? And we just worry, uh, focus on implementing or deploying applications such as publishing a website or, I don't know, um, configuring uh, push notifications or some other services, right? So they, they are installed, they are running in these virtual machines, which are already pre-configured, but you don't worry about some, some, some things. You just focus on your code, on your application. And there is another offering known as software as a service. Uh, for example, Office 365 is one example of it. You can easily, without installing anything, just create an account. You can immediately uh, create a PowerPoint presentation by using cloud services of Office 365 or Word document, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't worry where this software is installed. You just access and create the content. Serverless, it's similar to PaaS, but cheaper. Because in, in serverless, you just focus on the application. You don't even need to configure how to scale or architect your uh, server, just your code, just your application. Serverless doesn't mean that there is no server. There will always be a virtual machine server, your, your code is running somewhere. But as a developer, you don't worry about it. So, so there is server abstraction. This code will run or will be triggered according to some events. For example, when, we send, when users send HTTP requests, or maybe according to some a timer like okay i want this code maybe i want i have some code that cleans up a database that deletes non-valid data and i want this one to run every day at 3 a.m like an scheduled task 
at 3 a.m. No one is using my service. So yeah, it, it can perform this cleaning process or some other activities. Yeah. Also, you are built by the execution of your code, not by the hosting of your application. So actually, this saves cost. This is known as uh, microbilling. Um, also, some processes such as uh, deep ops is uh, reduced. You don't have to, to worry about uh, huge or complex uh, scenarios. You manage applications, not servers. This is related to our first uh, topic. And you can very quickly uh, deploy to production. Go go to 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 market this market or monetizing your your application right offering as services. Azure has different uh, application uh, resources for serverless. There is Azure Functions and Logic Applications, Logic Apps. The difference basically is the target for for this. In function functions is developer oriented, so you write code. In .NET, C Sharp, sorry, C Sharp, F Sharp, PHP, Node.js, Python. In and logic app, for logic apps, you use a Visual Designer. So you add some component that is a graphical user interface. You you select some element, then you you start connecting some elements. For example, maybe I want this code to to run. Sorry, I want to run this flow of activities when some user answers some feedback form. Maybe I have a Microsoft Forms uh, that I want to run some, some flow every time that the user hits uh, send, right? Because maybe I want to store these responses, these answers, into a database. And without writing any single line of code, I can build this uh, flow. But by using this Visual Designer, there are uh, many connectors. For example, you can even send an email. Thank you for answering this form or some other activities. Um, and in, regarding functions, yeah, you also have these bindings or triggers. Trigger is what will execute your, your code. And well, there are several options you can interact with different different functions, different logic applications. Right? Basically, but we are going to talk or we are discussing Azure Functions. But yeah, it's worth uh, knowing the serverless options. Basically, as I said earlier, Azure Functions is your code in the cloud. Then uh, we have uh, triggers. What runs or executes your, your, your code, right? Maybe, for example, we develop a mobile application and we store the picture in blob storage. And we want that every time that a picture is sent to this uh, cloud storage, we have a function that produces different versions of this picture, uh, larger sizes or escalated smaller versions. To, 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 to reduce the, the size, for example. Or maybe we send messages to a queue, and every time that a new message arrives, it should be processed and do something with it. Right? There is also timer trigger, as we mentioned, or we can connect to other APIs by using a webhook, for example, Twilio or GitHub. And we can bind, we can uh, have different uh, files or elements included in our uh, application, such as <clears throat> a file, Excel documents, emails, right, notifications, and others. Uh, in uh, Azure Functions, you will write code, as I said, and this code can be really uh, small, right, in order to process some some input, some information, right, and Usually, we have this function.json file that uh, we have bindings and triggers. This binding is, for example, input image. Th this is the same for this example that I mentioned here. There is input image. 
what is arriving to our blob storage. So this image that arrives, which is in some container, we want to produce escalated version. So you can see that here there is input direction and output direction here, output, right? So this is the new file, sorry, this is the file that was sent by the mobile application, and this is the new version, and in different container, of course. Then we bind this image or file name in our uh, code. And, and you can see here that we don't have any reference to blob storage client or something because it is already bound. We, all, we worry on the uh, stream or the string file name, the content, right? In order to do something. In this case, we are using some library, image resizer, which already produces escalated version of our input image. Right? Yeah, and we just connect the, the dots. So for our solution, for our purpose, right? Give a second. Um, I'm sorry. We want to, for example, take this machine learning model and uh, generate some prediction, some result. So this is the code. This is the, the second project, Prediction API, right? Uh, and you can see, well, yeah, this is a natural function. We have the wrong method. And we also have an HTTP request. In this case, this is HTTP uh, trigger. So it will run every time I send some HTTP request. And you know, in this request, we can get the body. In the body, this is the, the data that our mobile application, for example, can, can send. Like, OK, in this data, we will have the characteristics of one trip. And you know the characteristics how many people, trip distance, trip time, and so on. So we can just take this body, and you will see some familiar code. We have an ML context. We load our model. I have methods, load mo lo local model and Azure model. But basically, it's, it's the same. It's just how we load or how we get access to our machine learning model. In this case, I manually included it here. As you can see, as it's part of our solution, we load it with the memory context, right? And after that, after we load it, we create a prediction engine, and you saw it in, in our previous test. This prediction engine will be used, we will use the predict method with our data, text trip. And we will get a result. This result will include the prediction. And the prediction uh, tells us the fair amount. So I will run it locally, this prediction API. Right? So, so you, you will see uh, console uh, command line, right? And we, we will get some endpoint, local endpoint, which is. You will see in a second this one. So I can send requests to this local host in this port API, prediction API. And I have Postman already installed. So let's just uh, load it. And we are we are close to, to finish. So to, to test this endpoint. Okay. So here I have, yeah, you, you can see I already prepared this local request. And I am sending in the body some sample data, OK? This is my object. This is what I want to predict. Maybe I will change something. Let's say passenger count is uh, 5, and the trip time is 900 seconds, right? And let's hit Send. And it will tell us that for this trip, the prediction is, we will wait a few seconds, right? Um, OK, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, I'm not sure why it is taking some time. Let me see. Maybe I added some point or something. It shouldn't take too much time. Uh, prediction API. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why it is taking some, some time. I, I will cancel it. I will hit uh, run again. But for some reason, it is not working, but um, OK, I, I will just stop it and try again. Ah, oh, yeah, I, I got it, but for some reason, it was a stop. But, but you see the, the result here. Per amount, 14.58, right? Uh, 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 and so, yeah. So this is a local test. Then uh, in Visual Studio, there is a way to very quickly publish it to, to the cloud to, to create a service. So we can just select our project, hit publish, and we will uh, go through some wizard. And very easily, we can deploy it to, to the cloud. In this case, I have already uh, created this. And, and you get endpoint, public endpoint. Uh, which is this one, serverless ML prediction API dot Azure websites dot net. I already have in Azure this resource created. And the idea is, OK, since I have this public endpoint, I can maybe create a mobile application, which I already have here. Uh, uh, it's a summary mobile application. So I can deploy it to, to Android, iOS, or Windows 10. I, I will test the Windows 10, which is the fastest. To, to load. And you will see that now I am sending requests. OK, for some reason, I am not getting the output. OK, uh, let, just give me a second. Because, yeah, not, not sure what, why uh, I, I got this. Just a second. I need to select UWP deployment. OK, so, so you will see a mobile application that consumes this model, right? So again, I already prepared some, some data. Maybe I have five passengers, and the trip time is 500. Then we hit predict, and we will get the result. Maybe the trip fare is $14.58. And for my mobile application, I am sending the request to, just a second, to this endpoint, which is the public one, right? Which I already mentioned to you, which is my Azure function already deployed. This one is already in the cloud. I didn't have to create ASP.NET core. It was Azure Functions code, very simple, very easy. And then I, I sent the, the request and just implemented in my mobile, in my code, in my mobile application. This is HTTP request, right? I don't have anything about ML.NET. I don't worry about it. It is in my API, right? And well, one of the advantages of summary is that I can switch to maybe Android, and a mobile uh, simulator will run, because I don't have device, but I have this emulator, and you will see the, the same application, but now running on Android phone. I will send the request, and I will get, again, some, some result. So this is what allows me right, to, to connect, to develop some, some application, use different language. Well, I tested it with C Sharp, but you can create website running in PHP, send the request to your public endpoint, and you will get the result. right? So I will just hit predict, and it works, right? It, we will get the, the, the price in, in a second, OK? Yeah, so that's the trip for, for, for this amount, OK? And yeah, essentially, uh, that will be all. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I will do my best to try to answer them. And in the meantime, thank you for, for joining. If you want to reach out, if you want to further discuss these topics, uh, you can contact me in this uh, in this link. Okay. So, are, are there any questions?